Hello everyone and welcome very much to this event. So my name is Professor Rebecca Fitzgerald, I'm Professor of Cancer Prevention and Director of the Early Cancer Institute at the University of Cambridge. And um, I'm very grateful to the organisers from the ACE Alliance to organising what I think is a really important um, event and, and a new one. This is the first type of this symposium. So this is the first symposium from the International ACE Alliance on patient advocacy in research. So there are many benefits from discussing this topic. We hope that this event will provide an opportunity for us to learn from patient advocates and experienced researchers about how, if we involve the patient and the public, that can Im improve both the quality and the relevance of the research that we do. We also hope that this event will enable us as researchers to better understand and explain the benefits of our work to cancer patients. So I would like to introduce our first speaker. This is a keynote speaker from Dr. Christian von Wagner, who is a reader in behavioral research of early diagnosis of cancer at the Health and Behavior Research Center at UCL in London. Um, and Christian's work is focusing on the social and psychological determinants of uptake of the NHS bowel cancer screening program, as well as patients' experience and decision making. So, Christian, we're very look, much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, and I'm going to hand straight over to you now to give your talk. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to try and share my screen. Okay, I hope everybody can see this now. Yes, it's all yeah. good. Yeah, okay, great, excellent. Thank you very much. And um, uh, it's a great privilege to, to, uh, to give this um, introductory uh, uh, presentation. I, I, I don't claim to be uh, an expert, but I definitely have been uh, a, a privilege to work with some some truly inspirational uh, um, patient and public representatives. So I'm very very happy to uh, speak about this. Also, I, I've been very um, uh, happy and privileged to to kind of lead some PPI work as part of a policy research unit. And I'll just be sharing some of my own reflections. And I'll be talking for about sort of 10 to 15 minutes, and then we can have a, a and, and then very much looking forward to hearing from others as well on this topic. So just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about, it, I will start by talking a bit about PPI or patient public involvement in general. Uh, uh, when I so prepared for this presentation, I just found an interesting article that sort of compared and juxtaposed different ways of doing PPI. And I, I just wanted to share a few bullet points on that. But then mainly I want to talk about PPI in action, how I've experienced and how I've benefited from it, um, as well as how I've been involved in, in, in uh, co-creating PPI strategies as part of larger programs, what that's looked like and how that has actually been implemented and the challenges that are associated with that. So let me just then very briefly introduce um, this. You know, I was very interested in this article that I saw uh, from Journal of Medical Ethics. Uh, uh, it's a couple of years uh, old now, almost 10 years old, um, but very aptly entitled, Who is Steering the Ship? And what that article does, at least part of it, uh, is introduce two different types of um, uh, models, a slightly more transactional, perhaps, a uh, more uh, conventional uh, a way of uh, uh, PP doing PPI as a means to an end and a, 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 an alternative, more cooperative way um, uh, where PPI it becomes uh, an activity in its own right. And I think that sort of slightly also uh, reflects my own journey when uh, you know I started uh, off as a researcher almost 20 years ago now. And um, at that time, people were becoming more aware of the notion of PPI. A lot of the time, uh, uh, people like myself were still confusing it with the type of research that as a behavioralist, I do every day, questionnaires for patients, focus groups. Um, but eventually it, uh, it became clear that, that that's not really what PPI is about. Um, so this transactional model, I should say, is not a tokenistic model. It, it, the, the aim of PPI is to increase relevance and quality of research. However, 
the way it's done is still slightly more top down one way um, where the researcher is basically consulting with members of the public, but still perhaps calling the shots, saying when that is convenient and how that is convenient. So it is uh, you know, top down, it is pragmatic, perhaps sometimes even opportunistic. And it's a way of inviting a response, bouncing off ideas. Um, and it's very much outcome focused. Now, a lot of the time what I do is still actually falls into that uh, a framework, but there is an alternative where PPI becomes an end in itself. And hopefully some of the experience and that I will share falls, you know, has, has, has parts of that alternative notion of a cooperative model where it's not top down, it's, you know, uh, uh, members of the public, the PPI representatives give ideas. Um, it's a model where ideas are made from the bottom up, it's rights based, it's process oriented, so not just uh, completely focused on outcomes, very much framed by the representation of community values and preferences. There is much more emphasis on transparency and accountability, which is something that definitely is, is very important. And where the gap between researchers um, and, and members of the public, the hierarchy is very much leveled. And a, a, a model where, where new ideas, where where priorities are set, not just by researchers, but uh, really as a sort of peer-led activity. Now, the authors who wrote that article didn't necessarily advocate this model. I think they saw bits of it that, that were good, um, but still, uh, um, uh, so it, it's not necessarily the case that this is the, the ultimate model of how you should do PPI, but there are some really important things particularly around transparency and, and accountability and this idea that you know, we should close the gap and, and, and should avoid the sort of the, the social hierarchies. Um, and I just want to give some examples of my own experience and how I've experienced PPI and how I've, uh, 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 and the things that my colleagues and I have achieved through PPI. I just want to acknowledge Leslie McGregor as someone who's always a, a strong advocate for PPI. And together we, uh, uh, with, with Robert Carrison, we had a grant from Yorkshire Cancer Research where, um, and I just want to share this picture, we had co-design workshops. And I think the, the pictures that are on the screens now, hopefully you can see that this is not a focus group. There are people here um, in their own conversations, they're getting their, uh, um, uh, their hands dirty as well, they're looking at creative materials, they're giving direct input into the creative design of developing a leaflet. And this leaflet was all about trying to engage with people uh, about cancer screening and offering some, some community-based uh, education and outreach. Um, and you can see that, 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 that people were actively involved in, in, in giving their ideas and their contributions. And this slide just very briefly gives some quotations, which people reflected in what their community wanted out of that screening program, how it should be designed, and how the educational materials uh, should be designed. Now, as part of that project, we uh, then developed a leaflet but this was actually a, uh, a study that had multiple components. And another uh, illustration of PPI um, that I really like is also a, uh, having direct input into the training of health professionals. So another arm of this intervention was to reach out via patient navigation to people who hadn't responded to an invitation for cancer screening. In this case, this was the Bioscope screening program when it still ran in, in England. And so a very good colleague of mine, Lindy Bergman, who's a patient representative who I've worked uh, with for many years, uh, agreed to play the part of a patient who had refused an invitation. So this was not the first time Lindy did this. Um, I don't know whether uh, people know what patient navigation is, but these are basically we're training health professionals to, uh, to reach out over the phone to people who who uh, didn't turn up to their appointment. And sometimes that can be a difficult process. And Lindy is quite good at um, being a simulated patient who can, can uh, articulate some of the barriers that people might have and, and really challenge the healthcare professionals when they're being trained. And 
again, it was quite a rewarding process. And, and a, again, a very nice way in which uh, uh, patients can be actively part of a research project. Now, a final example I want to give is um, not just uh, the contribution of PPI as part of a project, but a larger program. So um, as I said, I, I'm, I'm part of the NIHR Policy Research Unit for Cancer Awareness, a Screening and Early Diagnosis that's led by Queen Mary University in London and by Professor Stephen Duffy. And at the start of this, uh, uh, of the second iteration, we really wanted to uh, strengthen the PPI input. And we um, firstly uh, um, constituted a, a, a panel, a PPI panel, and by way of introduction and by way of trying to create a strategy, a PPI strategy that would help manage the policy research unit, we set up a, a co-creation workshop. And this was very much, uh, a, again, I, I want to acknowledge Dr. Ratna Kaushal, who organized this workshop and co-led it with uh, colleagues, um, John Isaac from Partners in Creation, who um, uh, um, specialize in these types of co-creation workshops. And they came up with a purpose. Uh, they, they led the discussion um, and the activities around trying to find a common purpose, structure, and culture, all trying to galvanize and come up with a public and patient involvement strategy for a five-year program grant that has got very diverse uh, aims um, and, and, and studies that it supports. So I just want to share some of the, the things that were discussed during those workshops um, and some of the principles that we established. So under purpose, for example, people did point out the importance of reviewing research materials, but also to be at the heart of everything to do with the policy research unit, suggesting new ideas and identifying gaps. And just want to very briefly read this quote from someone at the workshop that really stipulates how important it is that we do this properly. So they said, if it really is about being a tick box, now I walk away. I'm not going to be complicit with that kind of gameplay. If I'm in the room, then accept me being in the room. You might not like everything that I say, and that's allowed, but please don't have me here as a hologram. I thought that was quite a powerful quote and underlined what the sort of the expectation was from the panel. In terms of culture, they wanted to create a shared sense of purpose, respect each other, promote, promote diversity and create a peer network. And again, just a quote here, as a new PPI member, you're thrust into the midst of academics, physicians, and expected to make conversation over coffee. This can be a big obstacle for some people. They can be totally faced by the social demands. So again, it's very important to, to create a common sense of purpose, a culture around training and empowering people to be able to do this, but not just the PPI members, but also the researchers, because we ourselves are not always very well equipped or adept at doing this. So under structure, Again, we established that there had to be a chair and a vice chair, but that all members should have equal status, and that includes academics. And again, here, very important quote, researchers tend to operate in cliques outside the meeting. We need to identify training for researchers to approach us as well as approaching them. So the need for re reciprocal feedback and input from researchers um, the need for face-to-face -face meetings, but also for safe spaces, for virtual spaces perhaps that are dedicated to PPI members only. Now, that is what we discussed at that workshop that was about four years ago, what happened in the end. So I just want to very briefly finish up by talking about best laid plans, the lived experience and personal reflections that I've had. Now we did do a midterm reflection as part of the PPI, uh, the PIU, uh, uh, policy research unit. And again, this is reflected here. So some of the challenges, you know, uh, uh, some of the bumps in the road really come from the challenges of, uh, around keeping people involved. Now, this was particularly challenges, challenging during COVID. There was far too much remote working, which created a di digital divide for some. And of course, there was sickness, both in terms of academics, as well as members of the uh, 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 as well as patient representatives. And this is not just about the policy research unit, it's about PPI in general. 
Um, and of course, sometimes even after a couple of years, people still don't feel sure how to engage and how proactive they can be. And there is a reliance on researchers to really make sure that they keep everyone informed and everyone engaged. And I still find that quite challenging sometimes because we don't all occupy the same space and it's easy to forget the need to keep people up to date, even if there is no specific news about a, a, a specific project. And then finally, the other thing that I wanted to mention is rewarding PPI is not easy. There still is a, a very little consistency in terms of creating a transparent, a consistent and fair payment policy. So there is a lot of variations around institutions or even within institution and a lack of awareness of how to meet individual needs in terms of what sort of contracts people want to have for example. So this isn't just about how much uh, to pay people for the work that they put in, but also how to do this, what kind of uh, payments should be made. And that still causes uh, uh, sometimes a lot of anguish and anxiety. So in terms of future recommendations, just to finish off, um, it's very important, I find, and I still don't do this very well, is to manage expectations and stay in touch. So even if there's no news, to still uh, uh, keep a, 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 an open communication. I think it's very important to have mentoring and training um, for both PPI uh, representatives, but also researchers like myself to achieve some sort of reciprocity and to create a social space, particularly now uh, post pandemic, uh, to try and really exploit the ability to meet each other face to face. Um, and I think that's my final slide. I just want to acknowledge, um, as I said, I've had many rewarding experiences. I've really been at, on the receiving end of uh, great things that have been established through PPI. And I want to thank all the patient and public representatives here, as well as uh, my academic colleagues. And um, yeah, that's it for me and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you for making it so accessible and um, relevant to everyone on the call. So um, this, uh, we'd love, we've got some time for questions, which is great. Um, so please put your questions in the chat or just indicate um, by um, raising the virtual hand and we'll try and get around everyone. Um, perhaps I can start off, Christian. So, I mean, I think many, many of us are very keen and recognise the value and importance of involving um, patient advocates and the public, but sometimes it can feel a bit daunting or we don't quite know how to go about it in the right way. So I was just wondering if you've got any tips for people sitting there thinking, yes, that's great, but how in practice do I make this work, you know, as well as you have described it? And do we need a, an expert do we need to go to someone for advice is, or is there a toolkit or something we can access so we could do it ourselves? Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's great. I think there is, uh, it, it, uh, there are now thankfully a lot of resources out there. Um, NIHR has always been a, a strong advocate. So um, there's a, a lot of resources offered by, uh, on, on NIHR website. I mean, one of the common ways in which, you know, the times when people really want to um, also reach out is when, when, it, when they try and kind of develop new ideas, maybe come up with grant uh, ideas. And uh, a lot of the funders now provide a, a, a great resources around um, uh, how to start off um, uh, uh, with, with PPI. In terms of recruitment, um, there are also now uh, useful resources. Um, so there's, uh, uh, there used to be, I, I don't know whether there still is NIHR involved, um, but there used to be a, a resource. And I think if you Google NIHR involved, you still get uh, a, a lot of resources and there are uh, people in research. So this is a website where you can also post um, and recruit members of the public, um, at least in, in, in the UK. Great, thank you. So we've got a few questions. So for, this is from Mary Berry. Do you pass materials to the target groups for review, especially diverse communities? Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, as I said, uh, ideally, we, we, we want to go a step further sometimes and, and have people at the 
creative end, um, just like I, uh, the example that I showed, is where you might have some, some building blocks, you might have some, you, know, you obviously want to explain to people what uh, the, 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 the message that you want to get out, um, and, uh, but, but really try and get as much as possible into the actual, uh, you know, get, get as much input at the start. In, in terms of how, particularly if it is community-based, to understand what community you're targeting and um, what should the people look like on those leaflets? Um, what should they say? How should they express themselves to make this authentic as possible? But then also uh, definitely uh, there are a number of ways in which you can then uh, target groups again, um, show people materials, there are research methods. And this is again where there is maybe a, a gray area between research and PPI. So the things like think aloud interviews that you can do where you can really elicit people's responses and evaluate people's first impressions of materials. And, and so the next question is from Erin Watson. So can you describe, I love this question, the biggest surprise or something totally new you've learned from an advocate? Yes, yeah, so that's a, good, a really good question. And, and so the biggest surprise, well, so the last time I was really taken aback by some about by a PPI representative in, in, a, in a good way is that I, um, a couple of, uh, well, last year, I had, I, I had an idea around using chatbots um, to promote engagement with cancer screening. So I got really excited. I uh, saw so a professor uh, of artificial intelligence, intelligence at UCL talk about his research and it all seemed very well aligned to the type of work that I wanted to do. So I quickly got together with a PPI representative and shared my idea with her, said, oh, we really want to do uh, just a little bit of research on, on chatbots. Uh, and, and, and see whether they can act as a, as a way of making screening, you know, uh, so passing on message about messages about screening. And so she said, okay, great, well, let's meet on Monday and well, let's talk about it. And so we met on, on the Monday uh, and she had actually spent very wisely, uh, spent the weekend uh, looking at various chatbots and, and then uh, told me that, you know, she really liked the idea that actually all the chatbots she looked at, she thought were really terrible and <laughs> that she wasn't really certain whether this was going to be a goer. And yeah, so that was one of those situations where, you know, she was very frank, but also had done her research and um, yeah, it, it surprised me, but I think it also strengthened the, the proposal I later wrote about um, sort of the use of chatbots. So that, yeah. that was the last time I was really surprised. So this is a question from Robin Zimmerman. Do you tailor the messages to religions, cultures, etc.? Yeah, yes, so no, absolutely. Like part of that is about getting the right, you know, the right input from the right people that are actually relevant to whatever it is you're trying to research, you're trying to do that are part of your yes. engagement. Yeah, no, that's right. And I think it is uh, uh, one of the re uh, one challenge that I haven't really um, pointed out is to get the right uh, to, to get diversity on 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 a PPI panel, for example. So that can still be difficult. We, we uh, even PPI panels sometimes tend to be dominated by maybe people who themselves have got uh, uh, um, some experience in research, maybe not in that specific area. Um, and and we, we're not always good at uh, getting a, a wide and diverse range of views. So ideally, yes, we want to have uh, diversity to make sure we can tailor messages to regions and cultures, which is absolutely key and is, is one of the things that PPI can really help with. Thank you. Well, I think that's a good discussion and a great start to the afternoon. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, we appreciate no it problem. and I'm going to Thank hand over to questions. Erin Watson now who's going to chair um, our next session. Thanks Rebecca and thank you Dr. Van Wagner. Um, that was a that was a great place to start for the rest of our session and I'm um, looking forward to the rest of the content. Um, first I would like to introduce Dr. Dr. Emma Woodward from the University of Manchester. Uh, Dr. Woodward is an uh, uh, an ACE-funded researcher, and she's presenting on her ACE pilot award called Electric, Early Detection of Hereditary Renal Cancer. 
Uh, Emma also serves as one of our directors of research for AIDS and is um, working closely with the Alliance to craft our research efforts and strategies um, going forward. So Emma, go ahead and take it away. And if you have questions during Dr. Woodward's talk, please drop them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of her talk. Thank you, Erin. Um, just share my screen. Right, is, obviously can't see you folks. Is that all sharing visually and can you hear me? Uh, we don't see anything, Emma. Right, so glad I asked that little question, forgive me. I mean, we see you. <laughs> yeah, you really want to see the slides, but not me. That looks good and- That uh, kind of looks a bit better, yeah. Yep, presenter view's on, looks great. Right, so I am presenting, um, if I take off this, early detection of hereditary renal cancer. And yes, I'm presenting, but it's on behalf of the team, Alison Christian in Stanford and James and Eamon in Cambridge. And thank you for the opportunity. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about the background science, but I'm keeping it brief because it is a, um, PPI e event. So the challenge that we have with renal cancer is it often presents late and there's a CT scan here and just to orientate you here's the lungs, liver, left kidney, right kidney completely distorted with a large renal cancer. And some data from CRUK, essentially the dots is survival, the bars and the bar chart are numbers of patients diagnosed. But essentially with these dots, once you sadly present with advanced disease, um, survival is very poor. However, all is not lost. If we detect disease at an early stage, there is a window for surgical cure. Currently, the standard of care for imaging, I mean, to detect RCC is imaging, but it comes with its own set of challenges, time consuming, um, you need radiological expertise, it's expensive, and it's not accessible to everyone. So the idea is actually, can we use a platelet transcriptome to detect RCC? So in other words, actually, can we detect renal cancer through a blood test by investigating platelets? Now I've still in this little cartoon because when I was at medical school, platelets were um, components in the blood that we learned caused clotting. Um, but actually they have a whole um, much wider range of functions and just to show just above that, if um, when you take a blood sample, if you let it settle, oh, my little cursor is gone. Anyway, if you let it settle, the red blood cells sink to the bottom, the plasma goes to the top and that contains clotting factors and circulating free DNA, which um, may have heard, will have heard about from other early detection studies. And that the interface between the two is a buffy coat containing white cells and platelets. And for those of you on the call who've kindly participated in our studies, this is why we need such large blood volumes because it's that interface is what we're after. So you might say, well, why platelets? Actually, they're incredibly active. They make RNA all the time that is reflective of what's going on in the body at that moment in time, and they actually amplify the signal. And the idea is not just as far out as you might think, because actually recently the Dutch group published their experience of using platelet RNA to detect early and also late stage cancers. So the team in Stanford, um, they had done some very preliminary work looking at spreadic renal cancer and controls. And essentially what they had noted, I think, I hope you can see it, it's not that, remove this down. Essentially what they had shown was complete discrimination between RNA profiles in renal cancer versus controls with highly significant p-value. We also have cohorts of hereditary renal cancer patients who are, as their standard of care, having annual renal MRI surveillance. When you detect a lesion, you watch it. When it gets to three centimeters, the surgeon removes it. And the idea is to balance cancer risk versus renal function. And this is where international collaborations such as AIST are just so valuable, because actually what AIST has enabled is the two of us essentially to collide together and ask the obvious question in all these hereditary patients who are having um, imaging screening, 
can we detect also an RCC through their platelet profile? So essentially you got together um, 57 platelet preparations have all been get stored at minus 80. They have all been air freighted to Stanford and actually the last box left yesterday. And preliminary results from Stanford have shown that the UK preparations, bearing in mind you've got to extract from that buffy coat at the interface, have actually been spot on. So we embarked upon this and it quickly became apparent that meticulous planning and investment from our participants was totally critical. Platelets continually make RNA, so the preparations have to be done once blood's taken. That takes two hours. So we were then in the situation of patients rather than blood having to travel. So then it was really obvious in embarking this study that early detection research is totally dependent on bringing together multidisciplinary teams of expertise. And actually, the reason why we're all here today is because we know that absolutely no research would be possible without our patients and families who are at the very core of what we do. Um, I'm an absolute devil for numbers and maps. And so, yeah, I've put on this. You for our many, suppose for our US colleagues, here we are in Manchester, Eamon and James in Cambridge. Patients have travelled from Birmingham, that's a distance of um, some 90 miles one way. And we've even had, coming all the way to Manchester, um, a 300 mile round trip of patients from Newcastle upon Tyne. The north of England is all areas of outstanding national beauty, it's country lanes and stone walls. So you have got to come the long way round. It was also really apparent the absolute critical role of patient support groups in facilitating research. And um, I hope John and Janice Hepworth are on the call. We owe them such a huge debt of gratitude. They represented the VHL Family Alliance because they completely understood the research and were instrumental in facilitating patient involvement. So I think as researchers, we do, and we absolutely should delve into the details of p-values experimental design. But also taking a step back, what we have found in our very small study is the absolute selfless willingness of people to participate. And it was extremely humbling. And then it was really immediately apparent that as researchers, we need to offer a heck of a lot more in terms of research patient advocacy. So therefore, we then set up a um, research patient advocacy forum. And that was obviously during the pandemic, so it was online. It was for participants and being a geneticist, family members, um, very important to come along to. We held two online meetings with semi-structured discussion and also clearly leaving time for open-ended questions. And the thing I think was touched on earlier, we did identify additional challenges and actually communicating complex information within families. So we were able to address that. And also that absolute need to reach out further to our at-risk populations. And it was in um, the chat from question from Christian's talk, how do we make sure we reach out to everyone often and including those people who often sadly get overlooked. In terms of the direct outputs from our um, experience, we created a patient information sheet, which actually was a complete team partnership with our research patient forum. A manuscript has been submitted and absolutely, as should be, patient advocates are there as authors. And we've set up for ourselves a sort of future framework for patients and families to be absolute heart of our research strategy planning and delivery. And actually we have used and built upon that framework um, for other studies. This is um, some top tips and I have to say, these are, this is from staff who kindly put this together in terms of tips for running a re an online research patient forum. And I have to be honest, we've sort of learned as we've gone along, so to speak. So it's important to have a housekeeping slide so everybody knows what the event is about. Um, people must feel safe in that virtual space. Discussions have got to be confidential. Um, uh, people can walk away and um, if you need to nip to the loo go to the loo absolutely we always have a 10 minute break we can go and get yourself a cup of tea and as was touched upon earlier it is absolutely only right and proper that we offer um, our participants payment for their time um, 
slides must be approachable. I know as scientists, we always just want to put up our results with lots of values and numbers, but actually it's about a two-way discussion. And it's also about keeping that dialogue open because we don't get it right all the time, but we leave contact details for people to get in touch. Uh, we ask for feedback, what was good, what was bad, please, um, and ideas for change. So essentially, that's um, our small scale experience. I think we have found them extremely powerful. It absolutely is a partnership, it's really enjoyable, mutually beneficial, and actually, we're here as an international forum, but individuals' worries about cancer and cancer risk, they're the same no matter where one lives. And it's really important that we address them. And it's given, I think me personally and all the team, really important insight into what research aspects are actually important to patients and families, rather than just what we as researchers might think is important. And this is a little Zoom snapshot from one of our sessions. And I would just like um, to finish off by thanking everybody, clearly patients and families, the centre of what we do, um, John and Janice Hepworth from the VHL UK Family Alliance, advocacy colleagues, the electric team, laboratory scientists, and there's Alice and Christian um, in the US and our funders. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. That was great. Um, um, so questions can please be dropped into the chat for Dr. Woodward. Um, and I do have a question for you as I was thinking about this, bringing in your patient advocates and talking to families. If you were writing this study now, would you, would you, how would you incorporate your learnings from the beginning? Um, that's a really good question. And I was feeling slightly sheepish listening to the first talk because our cart and horse have clearly been in the wrong orientation and um, absolutely start from the beginning and so for example our study when Kristen and Alice came to us with their platelet profile um, we knew that all our hereditary at-risk renal patients were um, having this imaging at that point and I put my hands up we should have said this is really tricky science we think it might have a value as a three-way partnership, how, how can we make it happen and how can we do it better? So yes, absolutely, hands up. And I think, and actually for some other studies, having learnt from that, it is definitely the way to do it. And actually, it is, a, it's more enjoyable, but actually it makes the science happen more easily too. So it's kind of daft not to. Yeah. And actually, I can just see, I've just popped into my screen. John, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Thank you for everything you're doing. It's uh, been a pleasure to be involved. We are going to hear from John in just a minute, too. So that'll be really great to add his perspective um, to the experience as well. Um, I see a question from Mary Pat. Um, so um, asking about overseas partnerships, do advocates act as messengers to bring information or just review materials? Um, talking about distances to participate, did that limit some people from being able to participate? So to answer the distance question, I have to be honest and say, yes, it did. Um, and that is a balance of these platelet preps actually being really tricky to do in the lab and the exquisite timing that goes around it and it was a pilot project so clearly if we do show a signal then we'll try and go large and actually think how can we incorporate more people so put my hands up absolutely distance is a problem and um, do advocates act as messengers to bring in from um i i'm probably the wrong person to answer that question <laughs> i would like to hope that the answer is actually to bring information and say emma hold on a minute why don't you think about doing it this way rather than as was mentioned in the first talk it is not a tick boxing exercise and nor should it be and actually when we do these forums i do feel quite challenged actually in terms of the questions but i think that's really right and proper yeah i agree um, um 
Um, so I'm just reading the question above. How much do you think the oh, team in the recruitment matters here for patients to run extra time? I think that's a really valid point. Now, I'm in the slight niche world of hereditary cancer predisposition, and I accept that as a niche world. It's not population screening where individuals already have a rapport with the clinic and they know they need to go hospital every year. So I completely appreciate that what we're doing is a sort of bolt on to that. Um, and for the most part, we have really good buy-in from the patients and families we look after. Um, it may be different in the population setting. Okay. Um, and I see there's one couple new questions. Um, Carolyn says, um, great to see these partnerships. Will you be involving your advocates, patient reps in thinking about and shaping future research projects, i.e. identifying the next research question? Um, short answer is yes, <laughs> with lots of absolutely and confirmations because I have learned such an amount on this journey and um, totally, and it should be a total partnership when you're starting with that blank sheet of paper. Um, and then this will be our last question for Dr. Woodward. What about challenges with technology? For yeah, patients? That is such a good question. So we had to do this by Zoom because we started it during the pandemic. And in one sense, we felt that was an equalizer because asking people to travel to a center is also can be a barrier. Um, but not everybody has access to the internet. I mean, you know, I couldn't even get my screen to share first up. So it is not that straightforward. Um, so I totally accept that some people will lose out and that's wrong and we need to address it. For what we've done for our um, online sessions is we have had a member of the team with a mobile phone and we've handed out the mobile phone number. And if people can't get in, have got stuck, then somebody's in the back with a phone um, helping. And we also help a bit like we do with our own work meetings, help the day before to set up and make sure it's up and running. Yeah, that's a really key point, and I think one that we might take for granted, given that we do. Uh, I agree, and not every not everybody has the internet, and not everybody has a nice flash laptop sitting on a flat surface that's in a quiet space. Yeah, important. Well, thank you, Emma, so much. Emma will be joining the panel discussion. Um, at the end of this call. So if there are other questions, you can save them for the panel. And in the meantime, um, we are gonna go ahead and move on. So thank you for your questions and your engagement. Um, I do wanna just say that my name is Erin Watson. I am the ACE program manager at OHSU in Portland, Oregon. And I have had the really fun and um, exciting pleasure of getting to work with Carolyn Cruz at CRUK in developing the ACE patient advocacy or patient public involvement panel for ACE. And um, it has been uh, probably about six months since we really in earnest launched our recruitment efforts. And we finally have a full panel from the US and from the UK that are in place and we are kicking off our joint meeting in January. So we are very much at the earliest stages of providing advocacy and input for ACE research. Um, and to that end, I wanna introduce um, two advocates who are serving on the ACE panel, and then one who did work with Emma and her team on the electric tr um, trial, it's not a trial, the electric study. Um, first, I would like to introduce Malcolm, from the UK, who is joining the ACE PPI panel. Thanks, Erin. Hi, everybody. I'm Malcolm Rhodes. Uh, I live in Edinburgh, Scotland, which is way off the top of uh, Emma's maps that she showed you earlier on, far, far further north and colder and darker than even Manchester. Um, I, uh, I was diagnosed just about five years ago with follicular lymphoma, which is uh, an indolent uh, form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And um, I, I, I was treated with chemotherapy and an antibody and all's good now, I'm feeling fine. And uh, as far as I know, in, uh, in remission. 
and I sort of wanted to know more about my disease and my prospects and I sort of went to an event at a lymphoma charity which was excellent for sort of more information about treatments and, and so on. Um, I probably should explain that follicular lymphoma is treatable but not curable so I already knew that I was probably going to have a, another round of treatment sometime and wanted to know how good that was going to be. And then I kind of drifted into patient adv advocacy, um, to cut a sh long story short, in the sort of lymphoma clinical trials group, the academic clinical trials group, and uh, selfishly learned quite a lot about what I wanted to know. Uh, and I realised then how imperfect the diagnostic systems were in our country and the, the technologies used. So since then I've sought out and tried to support more research into those areas. Uh, so I joined the, the Cancer Research UK uh, early detection panel that, that reviews grant applications. And, uh, and now today I'm looking forward to working with you guys here to sort of push forward in research to, to help diagnostics research more generally, which I think is a Cinderella area of research compared with therapeutics in, in very general terms. So thanks for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to working with everybody here. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, I, these um, advocates will be joining the panel discussion as well later. So um, if you have questions that you'd specifically like to address towards our advocates, um, please be sure to drop those in the chat when we get to the panel time. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce Mary Pat and invite you to, to um, introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your story. Hi, Mary Pat Berry is my name, and I'm a scientific research advocate at, um, or, at Oregon in Portland. Um, I am come to this from a family that had a very, very high incidence of cancer that was pretty much unidentified. Notably, my mother and grandmother both died by the age of 50 aunts and uncles also. Um, my dad and my brother also passed of other cancers. My brother's uh, related. When I was 13, my mother was first diagnosed. And I had my first of many biopsies starting at age 22 with some genetic testing, which wasn't really available at the, early on. Um, I was found to have a, what's called a check two mutation. And thus far I've had two diagnoses of uh, breast cancer. Um, basically, I came to this because I don't have the luxury of patience anymore. And I felt I really needed to do something and that I couldn't be passive on it. Um, I don't have any um, background in biology or science. My background includes graduate work in education and specifically as a reading specialist and with a great interest in serving, and I did serve underserved um, underserved students and um, have a great interest in health literacy. Um, I've also spent a lot of time starting two nonprofits and working in uh, pro nonprofit governance and volunteering. My journey in advocacy has included trying to learn enough to ask the questions. So I've done a lot of the national kinds of training, AACR in the United States, they all have different things that offer training. Um, Coleman, I've served on the, on the local Coleman board, um, done research um, trials um, and uh, done a lot of, what should I say, uh, review, worked on reviews on the national, local and um, nonprofit areas. So that's what I kind of bring to, I believe I bring to the table. And I'm hoping that researchers can also see that some of us can bring different skill skills to it. I have been working since 2000, I believe it's 2014, that um, the OHSU uh, Scientific Research Advocacy Program started. So I've been active since that point. Thank you, Mary Pat. Um, and finally, I would like to introduce John who did get to work with um, Dr. Emma Woodward and her team on the electric study. Um, John, welcome. Thank you, Erin. Yeah, it's uh, a real pleasure to be here. Uh, really pleased to be involved. Uh, my name is John Hepworth. Uh, I live in North Nottinghamshire in England. Um, I'm a trustee of the VHL UK and Ireland charity. 
uh, and I'm also a, a VHL patient. Um, for those who don't know, VHL stands for von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, uh, which is a rare hereditary genetic disorder. Uh, basically, everyone has a VHL gene, uh, but the one I've got uh, has a deletion on it. So, and this has come down uh, in my family, the male side uh, of the family. So I've inherited it from my father. Um, it's because the gene has a deletion, it doesn't carry out the function that it's meant to, uh, to do. So it results in me having uh, cysts and tumours, several organs. Um, I lost a kidney to it about uh, eight years ago, and uh, I'm now in a position where I have cysts and kidneys, uh, so cysts and tumours on my remaining kidney, my left adrenal gland, my pancreas, liver, brain and spine. And uh, there's currently, there's no cure for this. Um, and the treatment involves regular monitoring, largely through uh, MRI scans, uh, which I have three or four scans a year. And as and when necessary, uh, some surgery involvement. So uh, I was delighted to, to be involved with the ACE project because um, the need for the research uh, in this area is um, well, it's absolutely vital for all, certainly all VHL patients. Uh, so yeah, absolutely delighted to be involved. Thanks for being here, John. Um, and um, you'll be joining us on the panel later. So uh, should anyone have additional questions, we'll address them to you then. Uh, in uh, moving on with our agenda, I now have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Ignacia Ortega and Dr. Jackie Shannon. Dr. Ortega is from the University of Cambridge and Dr. Shannon is from OHSU, my home institution. And they're going to talk with us about their ACE funded pilot called Represent, a community engagement roadmap to improve patient representation in cancer research early detection. So I'm not sure which one of you is going to be leading off, but I'm happy to hand it off to Dr. Ortega. Hi, uh, I just want to also introduce uh, Dr. Jessica Courier. She's going to also be presenting with us. She's from Oregon Health and Sciences University. And so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, in the meantime, I want to say thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to make sure that I can share sound because I want to share a video with you. Um, what can you see? Uh, we can see your PowerPoint presentation, but not in presenter view. Okay. And now you see in yep, presenter looks, view. Looks yep. great. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you so much, Erin, for the introduction. Um, this is represent, and we are a really big team uh, composed by researchers from four universities, plus uh, public contributors from the US and the UK. I want to share a video to, to just show the background of what we're trying to achieve and what is the challenge. I hope it, the sound works. Clinical research aims to improve health outcomes so that everyone can live longer and healthier lives. Scientists observe patterns in the data to answer medical questions. The contribution from the public is essential. Without the data they provide, there is no possible answer and no medical innovation can happen. What does that data look like, you might ask? Members of the public are invited to participate in several ways. Donating blood samples, giving access to medical records, or answering various kinds of questions about their lives. To make medical interventions work for everyone, data needs to be diverse. It needs to represent everyone. But some groups are often left out. People who struggle to access healthcare and those who have different ancestries, bodies or capacities. The exclusion is a problem. The same groups, those seldom heard in clinical research, often suffer the most from the issues scientists are trying to solve. Scientists understand this is a problem of representation in research. It is crucial. New medical interventions should benefit all of us. 
To overcome these exclusions, we need to build bridges. And this takes time and effort. Our research shows that many scientists feel that they do not have the skills or the time to figure out how to create those bridges. This is partly because of training curriculum, career incentives and funding timelines demanding results in short timeframes. We need a roadmap to make it easier for scientists and communities to connect. Our community engagement roadmap seeks to increase diversity and democratize the benefits of early cancer detection research. This research to find cancer earlier when treatment is more effective. Early cancer detection happens in laboratories, clinics and the community. All of us can be part of it. We know that engaging with any social group is no guarantee of having them participate. Bridges need to be context specific and still some people might refuse to participate. We know of several reasons for this. We might be asking the wrong questions. Our research might not look trustworthy to others. People might have more pressing priorities to attend. The bottom line is that we must acknowledge that research is a two-way relationship. Researchers sometimes fail to produce research that genuinely benefits all groups, so it is only natural that some groups might not see the point of contributing to it. But maybe there are things we can do to become more trustworthy, ask better questions, and address people's needs and priorities. We need to listen more and think out of the box. We believe that leveling up power asymmetries in clinical research may allow scientists to answer pressing scientific questions better. At the same time, those answers may also contribute to the life and health of all the social groups we strive to serve. I'm going to stop it there for the sake of time. And now, if I can, I'm going to go back to my presentation slides uh, here. No, ow, oh, sorry. <laughs> so uh, the research questions. Um, Jessica, would you like to go ahead? Sure. So our study was guided by two primary questions. Uh, the first being, how can all community be included in cancer early detection research? And the second being, how can trust be built between cancer early detection researchers and communities? And the reason that we were guided by these two communities is we really wanted to explore ways to improve how health research uh, academic medical centers um, and diverse communities can work together so that participating in cancer early detection research benefits everyone. Next slide, please. As Ignacia mentioned, we had a very large multidisciplinary team that spanned four universities, all ACE centers. And this work took place on two continents in um, North America and Oregon and then also in the UK and Manchester specifically. And what this enabled us to do is to really dive deep and gain perspectives about participation in cancer early, early detection research from a number of different population groups, which included um, the Hispanic and Latino population, specifically in Oregon. And then we also talked to African Caribbean members, um, folks who were um, South Asian, Chinese, um, and white, and that work took place in the UK. And we thought that bringing together diverse perspectives from multiple different participants would allow us to form some really robust communication and robust recommendations to improve participation in cancer early detection research. Importantly, we had two community members um, and public contributors who you'll see on that far uh, right part of the slide. Um, who were a part of all of our meetings and were really important touch points throughout this project where we could go to and say, what do you think? What are we missing? Where are the gaps? Where are the overlaps? And they, they were very important um, guideposts for us throughout this research. Next slide, please. So in terms of the vision we have for the project, basically we wanted to learn the key principles and mechanisms to improve representation of underserved communities. 
but at the same time, we want to be respectful of regional realities, understanding that sometimes we propose solutions that only apply to one context or not another. And, and then what we wanted to do was to draft recommendations that were actionable, and basically that we could tell researchers and research infrastructures, you know, how to go about them, and also recommendations that could address both the long term and the short term. And here I, I'm really, really glad uh, to, to have here Dr. von Wagner's uh, presentation because I think there's so many resonances in what he spoke about in terms of the difference between a transactional approach in participation and involvement versus a rights-based approach. What we're trying to do with this project is kind of to push towards that second aim and you know build trust worthy uh, research practices and infrastructures so that we can include everyone in research. And that requires us to think critically about how we do the long term, how we plan, as Rebecca said, these evolving partnerships, how we can recognize them and acknowledge them in meaningful ways so, so that you know we kind of satisfy and fulfill the needs of everyone as much as we can. And eventually what we wanted to do with these recommendations was to disseminate them and across researchers, founders, and communities. And so we're very glad uh, to have the opportunity to present here as one of the dissemination uh, platforms. Um, so this is, was the process to create the 12 recommendations that we're going to explain. And these recommendations are trying to include everyone in cancer research, that's the horizon. So as Jessica explained, those are based on findings from fieldwork in Manchester and Oregon, as well as a scoping literature review that was done with implemented approaches in early cancer research that were trying to uh, increase participation of diverse communities. So all those research fundings that basically included uh, around 100 people then were distilled into practical recommendations that were discussed in a three-day consensus building workshop that happened online in June and where we invited 37 participants, researchers, community practitioners, um, funders, and cl cl clinical uh, professionals as well. And basically we, we discussed like the focus, the priorities, the wording, and you know, what is actually the, the, the important thing that we should prioritize. And so this was an iterative process. We created the recommendations during the workshop, but then it was a lot of uh, back and forth uh, over email to just get to the point where we could all agree, like we will achieve a consensus on what those recommendations uh, should be and how they should look like. And we got feedback from the representing, which is like the researchers involved throughout the stages of the project, but also feedback from workshop participants. Um, so the recommendations here have been grouped in, in four things. One is an overarching recommendation, and then we have three other categories, including practices that are mutually beneficial, communication and training, and then re recruitment practices. So our overarching recommendation is that we need to be able to establish long-term connections and trust and relationships with minoritized groups. And then that is actually a system-wide thing that we need to do as kind of research infrastructure rather than just something that happens at the level of a research team. And then we, we really think that we need to be able to create practices that are mutually beneficial in clinical research so that it's not about extracting the data from someone and then just producing your research and publishing, but actually, you know, that our research also fulfills some of the needs that the, those communities have. And in order to do that, we, we, we came up with uh, four th different recommendations. One is about systems some processes to share resources and expertise. Another one is to create inclusive employment opportunities and progression pathways for people from diverse backgrounds. And then it's about how we collect, analyze, and share participant demographics, and how we grant minoritized groups appropriate compensation and support. And you will see that this really resonates again with what uh, other presenters have said today. I think it's no news that you know our university system sometimes could be a bit faster in how we we acknowledge and you know uh, compensation and support. Yeah, so these four 
themes are cross-cutting. So a lot of these recommendations fit into multiple buckets. Um, as Ignacia said, we need to think about outreach and recruitment. And that involves training and recruiting awesome. community, community <laughs> champions um, to become peer educators. And what we're thinking about here is having community member, members or representatives who promote the study within their community and help to recruit offer um, a level of trust, right? They're a trusting, trusted source in their community and they're really, really pivotal and critically important to conducting research in a trusting and meaningful way. We also want to, we think it's very important to use representative samples um, in cancer into, in early detection research and to document recruitment and community engagement approaches. And so when thinking about representative samples, we want cancer early detection strategies to work for everyone. And the only way to accomplish this is to make sure that the research that is developing and exploring and um, identifying those strategies is representative. So we're not leaving anyone out. When we're talking about document recruitment and community engagement approaches, approaches this is an opportunity for the research community to learn what learn from our researchers and to apply the problems. Communication and training is critical. And in our work, we just, every single um, meeting we had with different community groups kept coming back to communication. So communication needs to be transparent and it needs to be honest and it needs to be ongoing. And research participants should understand what is being asked of them. And so what that looks like is communicating the benefits, risks, and expect expectations of participating in research. And that goes down to, this is the duration of the study. This is where you will go to um, you know, complete a survey or give a sample. They really, you know, being very transparent about the entire research process is important. We also wanna make sure that all of the study materials are culturally sensitive, translated into appropriate languages and accessible. So thoughtful communication accounts for an understanding of cultural and historical sensitivities, right? And in that, um, we mean that when we're communicating documents, we're doing that in different modes and, and methods that are culturally appropriate. And sometimes that's in person, sometimes that is over the internet, sometimes that is by text. And so it's really understanding those who are participating in the research and adapting the communication pathways to them. We want, we think that being trained in mandating training to researchers and the research community is really, really important so that they, first of all, understand the community group that they're working with and then can operate in a, thoughtful and respectful manner. We want to create opportunities um, for appropriate communication and support plan for participants. And this is really guided by that ethic of do no harm. So when we start screening for cancer, we're going to find it. And we just don't wanna leave our research participants with um, a diagnosis um, and or an abnormal screening and say, thanks, see ya. So this is all about creating pathways and support um, for folks who have participated in research so that they are supported if, if, throughout the entire process. And this could also, for example, connect with um, patient navigators, connecting with resources for follow-up care. So we just don't screen and go, we screen and stay and help. And then um, lastly, we want to disseminate study updates and results. So we wouldn't have research results without research participants. And it's really important to share results, to communicate to participants their important contributions to the study and show what impact they had in um, the findings that we as researchers um, identified as a part of their participation. And um, next slide, please. So Jackie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Just, just want to let you know, we probably only have about one more minute. Okay, I can be very quick here. This is just really an example, an opportunity to show where we've um, taken some of these recommendations and moved them into an actual project that we're moving forward. So I'm not going to tell you at all about the project, but really the goal here was to say, 
you can look at these 12 recommendations and implement them at any point in a study process. And here we had a project that's moving forward. We have 34,000 participants enrolled, yet our enrollment of Hispanic and Latino individuals is quite low compared to our population in general. And we're looking at this in, an, in a way that reflects what we have learned um, from the, the process that we went through here with this project. One of the things that we're doing is actually going to the community um, and doing something really unusual, using a positive deviance approach to understand of people already enrolled in the project that are Hispanic and Latina, why are they enrolled and help have them inform us of what is it that motivates an individual to be part of this project? What can we do to better build this trust um, and increase access to the project? learning from the participant, not coming with our preconceived notions of what is it that's creating a problem. Um, so next slide. Sorry. Uh, there. Um, so our goal here is really to move individuals from this concept of being, um, having, uh, <laughs> building this uh, trust and creating relationships and shifting from trust building into recruitment. And to do this, we really have to implement effective and novel recruitment strategies, but building off of the information that's gleaned through, um, through conversations with the community, through the development of culturally appropriate and language appropriate um, materials, moving things out in an accessible manner. And what's, what's somewhat novel about this approach is in this project, in an accessible manner, we're actually utilizing social media which oftentimes is viewed as inaccessible or perhaps problematic. But what we've discovered is that within our Hispanic and Latino community in the United States, the use of social media and the trust of social media is quite high, quite higher than our non-Hispanic population. So we're looking at using this novel approach for, for um, recruitment, but building the recruitment messages based on what our community members are telling us will be effective with their population. And I'm going to stop right there um, and finish up because I know we're over time. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. Um, we are a little bit over time. So I'm going to say if you have questions, please do drop them in the chat. Um, and perhaps Rob can get to them during the panel discussion. Um, but I would like to pass the baton. Uh, to Professor Rob Bristow from the University of Manchester, who sits on our ACE executive board of directors and who will be chairing this panel discussion. Uh, thanks for being here, Rob, and, and for leading this up and take it away. Thanks, Aaron. It's been, it's been great to listen to the discussion, very important. I'm just gonna show a couple of slides just to get our juices flowing for this panel. And I wanted to focus just because of time today, Aaron, on two issues. One is scientific co-creation, to come back and really think about what that means to all of us, actually, because it is a bit of a, there are some tensions in this, and I, and I think it'd be fun to explore it together. The second is about technology, and we just heard a little bit about social media, but I wanna talk about smartphones even more in depth and, and really open that up also for discussion and anything else that anyone else wants to, to bring up. So I wanted to talk a little bit, I'm coming to Toronto, uh, from Toronto into Manchester, um, we did something quite exploratory, and this was called the town hall concept in, in Manchester. And I'll just go to presentation mode, only take a minute or so. So this was basically disrupting the concept of the individual investigator and how would we build new teams for research in Manchester. So we actually offered a carrot, so 100 to 150,000 pounds, which was not a small amount. If teams could come together in a two hour period, that would be uh, a range of investigators from junior to uh, senior, the scientists and clinicians, but actually most importantly, were actually patient representatives, um, patients themselves are representatives in the audience. And it was highly interactive. It wasn't supposed to be you know, a, another exec meeting, et cetera, no preset agenda, but it was a speed date. And so this was Mancunian, so something from Manchester's speed date, in which the new idea would be related to us all in the room as a headline, a lay headline in the media in three years. And the idea was to have, an, was to have a new project that would face the public um, and actually change patient care. And the problems or the challenge of this approach when you bring some you know, people into the room and lock the doors for two hours is that for people who aren't used to team science, the principal investigators and some senior leadership, they wonder why you're doing it and why you're involving people rather than celebrating the individual because the return of investment is sometimes easier to calibrate. 
The other one for us was that we have a number of trusts or hospitals within the region. It's not just the cancer center. There are other trusts that do research who are very interested in involving them. But really important with the patient advocates. And having done this before, I know that having patients in the room changes the dialogue completely when you start to co-create. It, first of all, it changes the questions as you hear about in a moment, but also it, it holds us to account in what we're all trying to really do. So the projects that didn't fit the remit during those two hour period is that if you had the same team, same ideas, just wanted more money off the, off the map. If there were new teams achievable in three years, progress towards a real change in clinical care, that's what we cared about. And actually for us, a little secret sauce, it only could be done in Manchester, couldn't be done anywhere else. And that was another additional challenge. So. These are just some projects with some headlines. Uh, we found out that scientists are terrible at headlines and that patients and patient advocates are much better at headlines. Um, Manchester banned sunbeds, uh, wait for that. Silent killer bone marrow transplants stopped in tracks. Manchester lung patients are different to others in the UK. And when we looked at the return of investment to both PPIE experts, the hospitals and university, there were a number of things that came out. Um, one, a brand new grant for us, the ACE grant and something called mobile prevention early detection units where we take actually the early detection out to our communities. So instead of calling them hard to detect, um, we call it time to detect or time to interact. A new clinician scientist came out, new social policy that we reported to the city council in Westminster, um, trust alignment and new clinical trials and actually understanding that for certain ethnicities, we really had to uh, explore the trust around genomics, particularly germline genomics. So it was a really exciting series of, um, of, of, of actual studies that we started at that time in Manchester. And this was in 2017, 2018. And I'd be very proud of the return of investment, I think to all partners. The key though, that was, I think Christian brought it up and others brought it up was keeping people involved and, and making sure that you're feeding back on that return investment because return investment changes over time, of course. So I wanted to come to this, this scientific co-creation piece because in, our, in three of our uh, seven, um, town halls, the patients and patient advocates came up with the idea. The first that I'd just like to express was a question came from the audience was, were lung cancer patients in Manchester different than anywhere else in the UK or anywhere else in the world? A simple question. And we have a lung cancer center of excellence with University College London. So of course I looked directly um, uh, at the professors at the front row because they were keeners. And I said, so what's the answer? They didn't know. Turns out they are. Turns out that there's a mutation in RAS for some reasons at 40% incidence. We made a mouse, we reported back to patients, still looking at it. But again, and there are lots of reasons why that might be, but a patient asked a simple question that we would have never asked ourselves for some reason, because you know we were going too deep, you know, more of the trees rather than the forest. And actually it led to a whole new program. And there was another, another patient who asked again about um, you know, change in the way that breast cancer spreads to the brain or to, for example, the spinal cord. And that turned out to be a project. And so it was really, really exciting that the co-creation part came from questions that were actually not asked by the scientists or the clinicians, but actually asked by the, by the patients themselves. And, and I also think the discourse in the room when we're creating these projects was completely different because patients were in the room. I think that you know when they weren't in the room and having the same people around, there were a lot of egos and a lot of voices that were very loud. And it was wonderful actually to hear that uh, approach change in an opportunity for us all to come up with something that was quite unique um, when the patients were driving the agenda. So that's the first part of this panel that I wanted to kind of open up and which is, you know, how do we do scientific co-creation the very, you know, in best? And I, I would just say that I think we achieved it for some of the town halls, not for all of them, but some of them. True co-creation in which actually um, uh, the patients were driving the questions they drove the agenda. They were there when we did international peer review and were given the results. And then we're just now recreating again those fora to actually explain what the findings are. And then again, see whether or not it's impactful to the community. So it's kind of open up for discussion, um, but I'd really like to hear you know, from John and Malcolm and others, and, and, you know, and Jackie, uh, you can be the first on, on how we really do it so that you know, from a science, from a science standpoint, clinician science, we can actually say, actually, you know what, the idea was from a patient, and we're really, really proud of that. Uh, Jackie, your thoughts. Yeah, I, I absolutely love this. This is something we spend an enormous amount of time working on. Um, one of the challenges that always pops up for us, so I'll start with a challenge, um, is 
is that oftentimes there's such an unequal balance of power. When you pull those groups of individuals together into a room together, it, it takes a while to reach the point where sometimes the patient or the, the community member is comfortable making that question, asking that, you know, often it's prefaced with, this is really stupid, but, hmm. and, and at the end of the day, as you pointed out, oftentimes it's not very stupid and it's a really excellent question, but that power dynamic can be really challenging. Um, one thing that we've implemented here quite frequently, and we actually did it as part of the project we described, are these community engagement studios, which is a, a kind of a standardized approach that's used pretty broadly within the states, at least, um, for bringing patients in really as experts to address a couple very specific questions that the investigators may have and then move towards some co-creation of materials. But before they sit in the room together, we actually spend quite a bit of time separately with each group talking about what is it that we're going to be discussing here? What is the value that you bring? What are, what are the kinds of questions that you're going to be asking so that there can be that um, sort of balance created um, and that, that, that power equilibrium so that we can begin to hear some of those really important questions. No, re really, really good point. So, so the sneaky thing that, that I did with these is that first of all, we offered money right on the table, right at the very beginning, which was quite different, right? And the second is that um, there were no ideas that could be placed into my, my email or anyone else's email prior to the session. People tried. And so it, did a, it, did, it was very fresh in the moment. You know, what we did do for the first 15 minutes was describe the assets, you know, again, to everyone in the room in terms of, you know, because we did it you know, in a tumor site specific way for lots of different reasons. But, but it was really interesting when you have money on the table and how it's going to be spent. Uh, and they have to be completely fresh ideas. Within the first 15, 20 minutes, we triaged a lot of ideas. It was already ongoing. And actually patients really got into the spirit of it. At the end of it, because of course my accent was slightly different than anyone else in the room, there was a, a wonderful um, uh, British uh, breast cancer patient for one of the sessions, you know, who was interviewed because we did these YouTube interviews and they're online. And she said, you know, like, first of all, I thought this guy from, from the US, first of all, I'm not from the US, I'm from Canada, but it was kind of cute. And for the US was OTT, over the top, right? You know, but then I got into it. It was really fun, et cetera. And, and again, we, we, we found a project that, that actually she drove because she was really interested in metastasis. So, so in Britain, it was kind of a little bit um, not the British way to do things because it was a little bit, you know, right in your face, uh, but it was really, really exciting. And I'm wondering if any of the patient advocates, you know, wanted to comment on how they would feel, um, you know, developing a project right from the very, very beginning, because at the end of the day, uh, coming back to, you know, Emma's point, which she said, which is how she would do it again, she'd have them at the very beginning. And this literally was the very beginning. There were no projects, right, on the table until we locked the doors and all the funders, et cetera, stayed at the back and were allowed to say anything. So I'm just wondering if the patient advocates wanted to, um, to say anything about this at all. I think um, Mary Pat Berry uh, <laughs> said money talks, I guess, right? Is that what you want, Mary, in terms of uh, the concrete way? No, I was just saying that patients and the people from the community need to be really valued. Yeah. And one way of valuing it is money. There are certain grant mechanisms in the states now that require it, a group of grants called PCORI that require um, that the patients uh, receive money. But there are other ways that patients can be valued. And I just wanted to be sure that that was also part of it. You mentioned some of that in terms of taking their thoughts, allowing co-creation. I think looking at it as a partnership is another way and using the word partnerships not the participants, yeah, or, you know, or the subjects. Yeah, no, I agree, and that's why we call them teams. So they're part of the they're part of the team, like forever, right? I mean, that's that's the whole piece here, and and I think it's really important. I love the concept of authorships. It's not done enough, actually, in in terms of in terms of authorships and placing again uh, patients on you know in, on papers uh, with that particular. A point to group because again, if I can just be very clear, you know, when when we think about authorships now, of course, we're asked at the very end, but exactly what role everyone did, and that's because some of these, you know, studies are now seventy people with whole genomes, etc. And one of the first questions is idea creation, right? And and then actually for for the lung cancer uh, project that that we were talking about, um, that that patient advocate is actually going to be there under that category at, at the end of the day. So very very important. If they can be there when you're presenting. Yes. 
Yes, of course. Be part, yeah. be part, be part of that. Um, yes, and, and, and they're part of it, a permanency, right? So, so the, the fact that it was a one-time kind of award to prime the team, and actually a, lot, a number of these teams now have gone after three million, you know, three million pound uh, awards. So it's actually really quite, uh, I, I think it's, it really was seen as a pump priming, but these teams have stayed together and the patients are part of those teams, which is very exciting. Um, one, one thing is just as it, maybe a, just to change tack a little bit is about technology. And we heard a little bit about technology and the trust of technology. And, and I was kind of curious about what people really thought, you know, how far can we take the, the smartphone uh, uh, piece? And, and I guess, you know, it comes back to, I think a little bit what you were saying, Jackie and others around trusting that the, the data that you import into that phone and then send away to the, to the black void of someone on the other end is, is actually something that everybody is going to know that it's cyber secure. And one of the conversations we had with our, our, our black community here in Manchester, which is, is slightly different in makeup, it's an African continent uh, based community, was a real fear that, for example, um, data and even when we if we were doing germline data would actually get to the police and would actually be, be, be actually something in terms of that someone could search, you know, for records, et cetera, particularly at a time when, uh, you know, in Britain anyways, there's, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, stop and search uh, controversies right now. So, so it was a very interesting, um, you know, a very interesting dilemma. And, and of course, we're reaching out into those communities. But I, I'm just wondering, again, you know, the, most people have smartphone or, or access to a smartphone. And, and we find that, you know, at least when people engage in it, they continue to engage. I guess I'm, I'm very curious about, you know, people's experience in terms of, again, the sense of cybersecurity and, and, and about the data that is entered. And have you had experiences across different types of groups or ethnicities in which things might, you know, work well and others might not? And, and I, again, really would love to hear from the patient advocates, you know, Malcolm, John and others about what your thoughts are about actually interacting completely with your team by your phone, at your home, in your home. Yeah, I think from from my point of view, I, th I think the problem you you have there is a generational issue. Uh, I think obviously the younger the patient, the more willing and uh, and acceptable uh, they are to use in social media, mobile phones. But uh, um, I, I do think there's an element of, um, of generation in that. I think uh, uh, older people. Uh, haven't been brought up with uh, that sort of media and um hey john age is just a number haven't you heard yeah <laughs> well well i mean i so think i think us. you're absolutely yeah. right and of course you know that the, the you can't go completely it has to be a hybrid a hybrid system and you know and and valerie of course is pointing out that trust is so important and and again you know trust will vary from diverse communities as as you point out valerie i guess the other piece that's really really important is that again what we've already said is the community leads right are those are those links in which they are trusted within their their communities and that you know uh, me like the white guy with white hair going into a black community and and again trying to uh, you know tell people what to do it's that that's so you know 20 years ago and in fact, what we do, of course, is, is have community leads and, and we describe what are the best ways, you know, listen, actually actively listen, but I mean, what are the best ways to interact, you know, with those populations to try to dispel some of the myths and to see again, if we can increase the engagement, but also do something very bespoke to an ethnic community in which the genomics might change, of course, how we do early detection and certainly how we do precision medicine. Um, so it's a really exciting time for that. And, and you know, there are, no, there are no FDA trials that are approved, of course, for doing precision medicine based on ethnicity. That's because we don't have the data either. And we don't have that diversity. And it's really important to get that. Um, Valerie. Yes, um, I'd just like to, to state a comment because um, I've been involved with some of this with SWOG as we've been developing um, a, a community advocates. And so um, having trusted members within some of these communities that are very hard to reach is so important because they live within the community, they understand the community. Um, and what we do is we bring them into um, the fold, basically. We bring them into our advocacy group and we have them as a as a resource to research advocates within the group to investigators they serve on committees um so they're you know we have a whole 
um, uh, plan that's been devised for incorporating them. Yeah, and, and we find that, you know, with some of our more, um, uh, you know, deprived communities where actually taking time out to come to us is just actually means a financial toxicity is, so we place our early detection programs on trucks and we take them out to shopping centers and we take it out to the community and that, that time to reach a piece. And, and actually, it, you know, there, you have to develop a whole team, of course, to do that because it's another resource, but actually it's been very important um, for us to engage in communities in which, I, again, because of actually they, they have other diseases other than cancer, they're quite complex, you know, populations and quite complex um, uh, uh, medical care issues, but actually it's a fantastic way because they, they get to basically in their own turf actually do, do early detection right close at home as they do shopping, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's something that's working at least for Manchester and I'm sure there are gonna be different, different approaches. Um, I'm just seeing that, um, again, it, it, it sounds like that, um, uh, you know, all of us are having the, the kind of the similar, similar approaches, similar, similar understanding. Finally, I would say that inclusive research is, is required to, you know, reach out uh, for those communities and to have those communities that are really driving um, those interactions themselves with, again, these fantastic leads and, and linking to them. And that, thankfully is a, is a much better way of doing things from a maternalistic or a paternalistic way of doing things again that I would say probably we were doing even up to five years ago. So so welcome the changes now as we're going forward. And the last comment, I'm gonna ask Malcolm. Malcolm, please. Oh, hi, Robert. Uh, just um, going to your point about getting involved, patients involved in the ideas end of things. Um, I, think, I think that's sort of really taking the hard end of the, uh, the system. I think uh, what I've seen of patient involvement is largely been that the clinical side is much more mature and obviously the clinicians meet the patients every day and, and get to know them. And looking at early detection grants, the, it's the projects where you know a bunch of engineers have developed a new detection method mm. with a, a field effect transistor where patient involvement is pretty tough going, really. So I think I think it might make sense if you're doing that early idea generation to talk to the clinicians and get them to bring in patients who've perhaps started to get involved in clinical advocacy and that that end of things, uh, because I think it's much easier for them to identify people that you like to work with, really. Yeah. Well, on that note, thank you for that sage advice, Malcolm. I think we would all agree with it. I'm going to hand it back to uh, Professor Rebecca Fitzgerald now just to take us out. Fantastic panel discussion. Thanks so much. Rebecca, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Thanks, everyone. I've really enjoyed listening to the presentations and the discussion. I'm sure we all have. Um, you always think you're starting to get to grips with something and then you hear these different perspectives. And I realize there's still so much to learn and we've still got a long way to go in this area. But I think as a community, we've made a start. Um, so that's that's progress. So thank you, everyone. Thank you to the speakers for sharing your work, um, taking part in the, the panel discussions and the question and answers and so on. Um, the patient advocates for joining the event and really giving us your deep insights um, into how we can take this forward and really work together as a community um, in a team team way. I think we've, we've got some good um, challenges to how we change our language. Um, as well as the way that we work together in partnership. So I really look forward to us growing this um, area, particularly as we go forward as an alliance, because I think we've been a bit slow to really embrace patient advocacy. So thank you everyone for your time today. I hope you've all enjoyed the discussion as much as I have. Um, and I think this won't be, this was the first, but I'm sure it won't be the last. So thank you everyone. Um, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.